Isn't it funny, just a little over a year ago, we would never be holding up a service waiting on somebody to start Facebook Live. It's a different world in just a year, isn't it? Um, again, so thankful that we have technology and ways to reach other people. Uh, but certainly, certainly should never take the place of us attending, being part of a local fellowship. Amen. Um, God uh, allows us to live together and share one another's lives, and that's what he calls us to do in and through the local New Testament church. Amen. And I'm so thankful for my church family. I'm thankful for all of you that are here. Uh, you keep coming back, and we keep sharing each other's lives and growing together. Uh, you take those opportunities that God gives us uh, Wednesday nights. I love our Wednesday nights and the intimacy there. Amen. I love our Sunday mornings. I love the time that I get to spend uh, with my church family. And so I thank so much of all of you and want to thank you for continuing to pray. Uh, speaking of pray, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Uh, once again, and ask him to bless our service and time together. Um, God, again, you know my heart. Uh, God, you know the good and the bad. And Lord, I ask you just to forgive me of my sins. And my shortcomings, God, that there would be nothing to stand between me and thee this morning. And God, that you would empower me to speak with your mouth and with your mind. And God, that you would speak through me uh, so that we would hear what you say to us. And God, I'm so thankful that you brought me to Victory Baptist Church. And God, for uh, the time that we get to spend together. And Lord, we don't know when that time will end. But God, we know uh, that we want to use it to honor and glorify the name of Jesus. Now, God, in this time we've set aside for the preaching of your word. Uh, Lord, may it bring honor and glory once again to Jesus. And that when we read it, Holy Spirit, uh, that you would uh, decipher it for us. Help us to see what it is you would have us to see and what you would have us to change in our lives. God, change me and change us uh, to be more like your son. For it's in his name I pray. And amen. amen. Well, again, whether you're here in person or whether you're on Facebook, uh, we have been studying in God's Word and thinking at Victor Baptist Church about pouring into others. Uh, we talk about mentoring and we talk about how this is important in the day that we live in that uh, people uh, invest in other people. And so we've talked a lot about pouring into others and uh, where uh, we think mentoring and teaching others is, is part of our path uh, here at Victor Baptist Church. And so we started a couple of weeks ago in the Psalm 145.4. Uh, which says, One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. And so all through the Bible, there are, there are points where we see uh, mentoring taking place. Uh, the older mentoring the, to the younger, one generation mentoring to the next. And so, uh, again, this is something that as Christians, we are called to do at whatever level uh, you are as a Christian. And so I ask uh, at, at every service, at least over the past few weeks, Sundays and Wednesdays, uh, I ask us, who have you and I been pouring into this so far this past week? Who have you and I been taking time for, taking interest in, sitting down talking to, going out to eat? Uh, what are you? Who are you and I uh, spending and investing our time and money in? Uh, and so I, I thought to myself this week, have I been too busy to serve? I thought to myself, have I been too caught up in myself to even notice opportunities God would give me? Um, am I not spiritually mature enough to even see those needs? Uh, and again, those are, those are questions that I pose to us that the Holy Spirit uh, spends time talking to us. And, and if we'll listen to that still small voice, he'll lead us to people. And he'll lead us into situations and opportunities uh, in order to invest in others. And so we must listen to God. Uh, speak to us through his word and through the Holy Spirit to change our lives to affect others. Uh, it's it's, it's going to take some change. Yeah. It's going to take, take some change in my life. It's going to take some change in your life uh, because it's certainly a selfless act uh, to pour into others. And so this morning, uh, continuing with that thought, uh, what does it mean to deconstruct something? Think about the word deconstruct. Well, uh, Brother Andy, it's the opposite of construct, right? Uh, you have construction and you have destruction. Uh, my grandmother used to say that I could destroy a room. That's destruction. Uh, if, when you used to come in after I was playing with toys, uh, man, there'd just be toys everywhere. There'd be stuff out. And now at my house, Lori, she was a little more constructive. She wanted girls to play with something, put it up nice and neat before they got something else out to play. So 
uh, my girls aren't as destructive as I was, but um, to construct something, you build or put it together, right? And I know some of you are, are, are great at building things, whether it's welding and, uh, and, uh, and metal work or it's wood, and it's carpentry skills, or whether it's putting together engines or taking apart engines or fixing. Uh, what I know some of you are just great at that. Um, I was joking with Brother Mike a while ago about possibly retiring and becoming a mechanic. Uh, and, and he laughed, cause, and I laughed even more because I'm so destructive uh, when it comes to that. I don't have the ability or the skill like him and some of you. But uh, deconstructing means taking things apart piece by piece. Uh, now, from an educator's pers perspective, some of you that are in the teaching field and been a part of teaching, uh, you understand when I say deconstructing the standards. This is something that uh, has been taught to teachers down through the last four or five years. Um, and in teaching, we have standards. We have teaching standards that the state sets forth, uh, things in every uh, subject that we need to cover and teach to our students for them to be prepared to go to the next grade. And so in math, we have math standards. and language arts, we have language arts standards, and so on and so on. And, and these standards uh, are very wordy. I mean, they're just big, long. We Students need to be able to blah, 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 blah. And it's very long and wordy. And so one of the things that we do every time they adjust and change around the standards is we deconstruct the standards. And so what we'll do is we'll get together in the summer, we'll get together on some of our uh, product, uh, uh, well, our uh, learning days, uh, and we will break apart the standards. We'll pull them apart piece by piece and look at specifically and even put in simple language the things that we want our students to be able to do based upon the standards. And so we make them student friendly so we can even show them to students and they'll understand what is expected and what they are to learn, which is very important in learning. And so this morning, all of that deconstruction has got to do with what we're going to do this morning in God's word. And, and if you study God's word, really, that's what you're doing with the verses. You're deconstructing uh, what and, and trying to pull out those pieces that God has had men pin for us in his work. And so we pull out those little pieces so we can understand and so we can uh, we can kind of chew on it all day. So we can put it into our brains and it goes to our hearts and we, we meditate on it, uh, the word of God says. And so that's what we're going to do this morning is we're going to be deconstructing a portion of God's word. And so we're going to be taking it apart piece by piece and seeing what God has to say to us about mentoring to others. Um, the verses that we're going to look at are not very long. But when you pull them apart and you look at the meaning of each part of the verse, it certainly has a great deal for us to learn. So we're going to be in 2 Timothy this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Second Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. I want to remind you that I read out of the King James Version, uh, but Hannah puts up on the board, I've asked her to put up the NASB Version, uh, which a lot of times is easier to read and understand. Uh, it certainly is a, uh, the most, from what I can tell, the most uh, direct translation from uh, the Old Testament, or excuse me, from the parchments and the scriptures. Uh, but uh, we're going to be reading from uh, 2 Timothy, or excuse me, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in Verse 3, and this is what God's word says. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of my, thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. And so what we see here in our passage of scripture, um, this is Paul uh, speaking to and writing to a young preacher named Timothy. Uh, Timothy uh, was in charge of one of the churches that they had started. Uh, I think that it was in Ephesus, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Timothy apparently was very young. Uh, we don't know how young. I could have been teen, late teens, could have been early 20s, but we know that he was young. And one of the things we also know through Paul's letters in the New Testament um, is that he mentored Timothy. 
Uh, he was a mentor to Timothy, uh, and certainly these verses uh, prove that out. And so what can we learn from Paul as a mentor? Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to deconstruct the words that God's Spirit uh, told Paul to write uh, for us to read this morning. And so we're going to be looking at uh, some of the things we can learn from Paul as a mentor to young Timothy. Okay? And so let's read the first part here, verse 3, and we're going to break down uh, the verse just a little bit. First, Tim, uh, Paul says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience. And so um, the first thing I think that we can gather from Paul right here is that as mentors, we must first be servants ourselves. You and I, as Christians, must, must first decide that we're going to serve God uh, before we can teach anybody else about serving God. Uh, now, again, there's different levels uh, of spiritual maturity. Uh, and it doesn't mean that someone that is younger in the spirit and faith can't mentor someone even younger in the spirit and faith than themselves. But we certainly need to understand uh, that a mentor is somebody that serves first. Paul says that I thank God whom I serve. I serve. Uh, you remember Paul, he was uh, one of the greatest enemies of Christians when he first started. He was a Pharisee, right? He sought to kill Christians, and, uh, and that was part of his thing. He thought he was doing God's will uh, in having Christians put to death. And then prison. And so we know through the through the Bible that God changed Paul. Uh, God uh, had uh, he had actually had an Paul had an intimate meeting with Jesus, didn't he? Uh, he was blinded, and he understood that he was kicking against the pricks uh, like a cow does or a, an oxen at the time. Uh, he was he was fighting against what uh, he should have known to be right, and he was wrong all along. But uh, now he's a servant of Jesus Christ. It says that he serves God, and he says he learned that. Somebody mentored him. Uh, somebody mentored him. And I think if you go back, I think it was Barnabas uh, that actually mentored Paul when Paul first became a Christian. Um, and so we, we understand that even Paul, and as great as a teacher as he was, and then learning of uh, the Old Testament scriptures, and, and after he became a Christian, he was still a baby, right? He was still someone that needed to be mentored. And so he says he learned that. Whom I serve, he says he serves God, and he was mentored himself. And so um, that's important uh, because mentors must be servants first before they can mentor anybody. Um, why is it uh, that some Christians uh, do not mentor? Uh, you know, Brother Rex and I used to think about the, 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 the times that when we were serving uh, as deacons at Liberty Baptist Church, uh, we really would have liked if somebody would have pulled us aside and said, hey, look. Uh, we need to be doing this, or we need to be doing that. And sometimes uh, we had to figure things out on our own. Uh, and I, I love the deacons that uh, were part of Liberty Baptist Church. Some of them have gone on to be with the Lord, and they were, were certainly a, a big part of my life. But there were times when maybe they didn't mentor like they should have, or maybe uh, they didn't take the time. And so uh, with all of us as Christians, why is it that we don't do what God calls us to do from time to time? Well, Here's some reasons. Maybe, maybe we're just not mature enough. Uh, maybe that we're not servants ourselves and we haven't learned as Christians that we are to serve. Babies in Christ is what uh, Paul calls it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 2, Paul tells the church at Corinth, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither ye yet now are ye able. And so a lot of times we don't serve, we don't mentor like we should because we've never grown as Christians ourselves. And so we can't understand the meat of the word like a baby can only take milk. You wouldn't feed a T-bone steak to a newborn, would you? Uh, you can't do that. Uh, they've got to take the milk. And so as babies in Christ... Uh, and that has nothing to do with age, folks. You need to understand that there's a lot of babies in Christ that are up in years. They've never grown spiritually. Uh, and so the only person that can tell you that is God. It's between you and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but what are babies? Babies are selfish and they only think of themselves. And they get upset at the least little things, don't they? Doesn't that sound like some of the people that you've been in church with? Amen. Sounds like a lot of people. And, and a lot of times it sounds like me. Um, I know that sometimes we all uh, are selfish and, and certainly not as mature as we need to be in Christ. 
Uh, baby Christians are the same way. And, and that is where some Christians are. Uh, some Christians can't be mentors because they have not uh, chosen to serve and they have not grown in the Lord to be able to be at that point. Uh, and, and some Christians, they're just not willing to invest in others because they're too selfish. Now, Brother Andy, that's not very nice. Well, I'm just telling you, that's, that's the truth. That's the truth with a lot of Christians. It's, it's, too much, uh, it's too much time to invest. It's too much money to invest. It's too much uh, time and money away from what I want to be doing or what I uh, would bring honor and glory to me. Uh, but what is an investment? Um, I'm not very good at investing, haven't been very good at investing money down through the years. Uh, but as I'm getting closer and closer to retirement, I'm understanding that my retirement uh, was an investment. Uh, and uh, it, it, an investment pays off over time. Uh, and so you, you put in, uh, and you put in, and you put in, and it grows, right? Uh, and, and then ultimately it gets to the point where um, it's something, uh, something nice. Well, mentoring is the same way. We invest in people. Uh, we put in our time. We put in our talents. We put in our interest uh, into people. Uh, no matter how young they are or how old they are, we invest in them. And we continue to put into them and pour into them and pour into them until they grow where they can pour into others. Do you see how that works? Amen. You, you, you get poured into, you get poured into, and eventually you overflow and you end up pouring into somebody else. And so we certainly don't want to be uh, not that. Uh, we want to be somebody that does that. We want to be somebody that serves and grow is, and is growing ourselves so that we can pour into others. And Paul, certainly not bragging here, says he's at that point. He's at that point where he serves. He's at that point where he has learned and he is growing in the Lord. But not only should mentors be servants themselves, uh, but we should also be praying for our mentees. And, and I promise you, I didn't make that word up. I had to look it up to make sure it's right. Mentees is how you say the person who you are mentoring to. Uh, and so let's read here in the second part of verse 3. He says, uh, again, that without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Paul is saying, to be a mentor, you've got to be a prayer warrior. Yeah. You have got to pray for these people that God would put in our lives. And so uh, not only should uh, mentors be servants, but they should be prayer warriors for those mentees. And so uh, mentors must pray for those people that God puts in their path. Paul was in constant prayer for Timothy. And he, what did he say? He says, without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. When I pray, Timothy, I am praying for you. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You say that to somebody, that carries a lot of encouragement with you. Yep. That tells people that, you're on, that they're on your heart and mind and they're important enough to be lifted up to the Lord. Amen. It's important, folks, not just to say it, but to actually do it. I, I can't tell you how it lifts me up uh, when somebody tells me, Preacher, I'm praying for you. Or that I hear somebody pray out loud and, and they mention me in their prayers. That's an encouragement to me. Amen. Uh, that's an encouragement to anybody that hears that. And, and we don't say that uh, for our benefit, not patting ourselves on the back. Uh, we say, first of all, because we're really doing it, and we know it's the most we can do for somebody and praying for them, but it's an, also an encouragement. And, you know, we studied a few weeks ago on Wednesday night how we ought to be encouragers as mentors. Praying for somebody and telling them that you're lifting them up to the Lord, that's encouraging to people. 1 Samuel 12, 23, uh, Samuel uh, was praying over the nation of Israel. This is what he says. He says, moreover, as for me... God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. Sounds like one of the songs the girl sang, didn't it? Amen. But do you see what it says? It says, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in not praying for you. Yeah. Folks, what we need to understand is that not praying is just not praying. It's an actual sin unto God. When we know that we are to pray and God puts somebody on our hearts and minds and we choose not to pray for them, that's a sin. I don't know if I'd ever thought about it that way until I studied uh, for, this, uh, for this preaching time, for this sermon. Uh, but when we don't pray 
for people specifically, it's a sin. It's not just not praying, it's sinning against God. And so uh, if it's a sin for us as Christians not to pray for those that God puts in our path, as mentors, we need to learn to do what? To pray without ceasing, night and day. Mention those people um, in our prayers. And so, again, the Bible says that we're to do this as mentors. Paul did that, right? He says right here, that's what it is. So we're kind of pulling that apart. We pull that out of there. And so not only should mentors be serving themselves, uh, being prayer warriors for our mentees, but they should also have a desire to spend time with them. Look at verse 4. It says, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Uh, now, I want you to take, and I'm not rewriting God's word right here, but I want you to take the first part of that and the last part of that and put it together because the part where it says being mindful of thy tears, okay, that's something else we're going to talk about, but read it like this. Greatly desiring to see thee that I may be filled with joy. Paul is actually in prison. Uh, and he, he's awaiting what's going to be next for him. He's assuming possibly death. Uh, but we certainly know that no matter where Paul was, he had other people on his mind, right? Uh, and Timothy was one of those people. And, and even though he's in prison, what he's saying is, I, I want to see you so bad. I, I wish I could be out of this jail and I wish I could be hugging your neck. I wish we could be sitting down to eat. I wish we could be uh, talking face to face. And he says, that brings me great joy. I just, I, I can't do that. But, but that right there, that, that brings me great joy. And so as mentors... We must have a strong desire to spend time with those God would lead us to. Amen. We have to give of our time to spend with them. We can't wait for them to come to us. We can't wait for them to uh, desire and come say, hey, do you have time to, or can we do this? We've got to go to them and talk to them about spending time together. Uh, and so... Paul had a great desire to, to see Timothy, and, and it brought him joy. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, this, this was something in a time when Paul, he could have been doing a woe is me, right? Paul could have been uh, thinking about a situation. He's in prison, and he's uh, possibly on the way to death, and he's probably certainly been beaten, no telling how many times. But he's not concerned about himself. He's concerned about Timothy. Who's preaching a church at a church, and, and he's he's young, and he knows that the wolves are out to get him, and, and he's concerned that Timothy stay encouraged. Yeah. And Timothy, on the reverse side of that coin, was encouraging and brought joy to Paul. Yeah. And so, again, we should have a great desire to spend time with those God would lead us to, and it should bring us joy to be around. It shouldn't be a drudgery. Amen. It shouldn't be a, oh, I wish I was out doing something else, but I've got to do this work for the Lord. Uh, you know, it shouldn't be that at all. It should be joy. And I'm going to tell you, every time uh, that I have been a part of somebody else's life in that, it always brought great joy to me. Amen. Now, I don't know about those the other people that I spent time with, but I'm going to tell you, it always brought me uh, great joy. And so uh, that's important that we spend time and that we're joyful uh, and bringing uh, them joy, or us joy from being with them. But that middle part right there, in verse 4, it says, being mindful of thy tears. Now, I think Paul was in tune with Timothy's uh, upsetting times as being a young pastor. Um, I think that he understood uh, that there were people in the church trying to preach and teach doctrines that weren't biblical. I, I think that Paul knew that Timothy was young and he was questioning his youth and he didn't have answers to questions and problems and things like that. And so uh, good mentors, I think, feel what others feel. Now, you all correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's called empathy. Is it not? Amen. Feeling what other people feel, isn't, isn't that empathy? Yep. Uh, Paul understood. He empathized with Timothy's struggles in life. Look what he says right there. He says, be mindful of thy tears. I want to spend time with you. I wish I could be with you. And I understand that you are upset about some things. Timothy was upset to the point of tears. And so uh, Timothy struggles in life. Maybe it was because he was young. Maybe it was just because he was in charge of a church. It may have been just because he was dealing with life as a young person. Uh, we certainly know the struggles uh, that some young people go through. Uh, but the Bible says in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. 1 Corinthians, Paul tells the church there, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, 
all the members rejoice with him. Do, do you understand that we're to share life together? Amen. And as mentors and mentees, it, it's an even tighter bond. It, it's an even closer union uh, that you spend time with each other and you rejoice and you weep. Uh, you're up and you're down because life has ups and downs, right? And so it's so much easier to share those struggles and not just to bear them on your own. And the Bible talks greatly about that uh, in iron sharpening iron and someone being there to help you get up when you fall. Uh, and so I have to be honest and say, uh, and I'm, I'm sure Lori could amen this, uh, I struggle with empathy. I struggle with it. Uh, because I, I have I have a hard time putting myself in people's shoes, um, and I don't like to be I don't like sympathy when it's bestowed on me or empathy, and and a lot of times I certainly don't do that. And so God has to work with me, and maybe God has to work with you um, on being more empathetic to understand what others are going through and to empathize and to sympathize with them. Uh, and and folks, I'm going to tell you something. I think when we do that, it's a great witness. You know why I think it's a great witness? Amen. Because that's the way Jesus treats us. That's right. What does the Bible say? Jesus empathizes with us, doesn't he? Yep. The writer of Hebrews says that the Bible feels, and that Jesus is our great high priest. He feels what we feel, right? That means he hurts when we hurt. Amen. That means when we struggle with sin, Jesus knew about that because, and we don't, we don't uh, like to think about this, or we don't think about it often, but Jesus struggled. He was tempted too. The Bible says just like we're tempted. Jesus was also tempted without sin. Um, and so those things as mentors, being a mentor, uh, it's not easy, is it? Um, it's not easy, or, or at least being a good mentor is not easy, is it? Um, good mentors do what? Let's, let's recap this. They're servants themselves, aren't they? They're prayer warriors. They pray for those people. Uh, they have a great desire to spend time with them. Uh, they empathize with the mentees. In other words, they hurt when they hurt. And so um, all of these things, I think when we break apart uh, God's word, we see that as mentors, these are things that we should be talking to God and allowing the Holy Spirit to change us to do. Amen. Because it's only God that can change and put those things in us, right? That's right. And so the last part uh, of our text today is verse 5. And, and I could have left this out. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, it, it has such great significance uh, to our congregation and to us uh, as mentors. Let's read verse 5 together. It says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Amen. Did you notice the last thing in our text here that Paul does? He reminds Timothy of something. What does he remind young Timothy about? He reminds young Timothy that he's already had two people invest a great deal in him. Yeah. He's already had two mentors in his life that lived the example that he could see and that Paul could even see that in him. Those people were his mother and his grandmother. Now again, I don't know if, if Timothy's father's in the picture. I don't know where that was, but I know the emphasis in Scripture, and this is the only place in Scripture that this is written, but I know Timothy's grandmother and his mother were of great faith, and that great faith was carried over, and young Timothy learned from his mother and his grandmother. Amen. Now let me tell you something. From a boy coming from a single mother and a household that just had the mother in it, I understand uh, what it means to have a mother of great faith. Amen. And I learned a lot from my mother. Amen. She was, was hardworking and, and she wasn't perfect. She was certainly not perfect. Uh, but I understand her great faith that she had. Uh, I understand that she prayed for me. Uh, my grandmother. I, I know I, and I had heard her and I, in my mind I could hear it over and over again. My mother, grandmother praying for me. And praying for God's will in my life. And praying for safety. Um, and just, just a great woman of faith. And I'm going to tell you something, mothers and grandmothers that are out there today. I don't know if you're a single mother. I don't know if you're a grandparent helping to raise kids. I don't know where you stand in that. But I'm going to tell you something. God understands and God uses you to instill faith in those young people. Amen. He uses you, grandparents. He uses you, mothers, to show 
that when they get older, that faith that they saw in you was not lost. In, it was not in vain. It was something that made a great difference. And Paul knew that. And Paul reminded Timothy of that because he wanted him to know that people had already invested in him. I can tell you something. There were people at Liberty Baptist Church that invested in me. Amen. There were people at Second Baptist Church that invested in me. There's been people here at Victory Baptist Church that have invested in me. And I'm so thankful for those men and women that God has put in my life. Would you and I be one of those men and women today? Would you and I be one of those mentors that would set aside our time and learn to serve and be what God wants us to be to other people? Crying for the next generation, right? Teaching them. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, again, I pray that your word would uh, pierce our hearts and our minds to the soul, that we would understand what you would have us to see, not because of what I said, but because of what your Holy Spirit causes us to see. God, again, we want you to inflict change upon us and change our hearts, change our minds to be more what your word says we're to be. God, I know that I'm nothing more than a no good sinner. And God, I don't understand how you can continually put up with my sinful life. God, that just tells me how great the blood of Jesus is and how it cleanses us from all sins. Now help us once again, Father, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. And amen.